Good evening. Good evening. So good to have each one of you with us tonight. Hope that you've had a great day. Glad that you're able to be back this evening to worship God with us. I announced this morning that tonight we were going to be looking at a subject that had been brought to my attention, a subject that uh, had has been discussed a little bit uh, among myself and the one that had, had raised the subject. But it's one that I think that we need to spend some additional time studying because it is an interesting subject. It's one that there's been a lot of differing ideas promoted as to what this is referring to. If I were to ask 100 random people, who is Lucifer? Probably the overwhelming majority of those individuals would say, well, this is another name for Satan. Or they would claim that Lucifer has some type of connection to Satan. But is this the case? Is this really what the Bible teaches us about Lucifer? Well, you may be interested to find out that this word, Lucifer, is only found one time in the Bible. And it's only found in translations that are based upon an ancient Latin text that was originally prepared by a man by the name of Jerome of Stridon. This text has come to be known as the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible. Later on, this same text was used by a man by the name of Desiderius Erasmus. Now, be prepared. Those are all going to be on the test here in just a little while. But these same texts were used in 1538 when he prepared a Greek text of the Old and the New Testaments from those Latin texts. And eventually, those two texts, the one by Jerome, the one by Erasmus, also a text known as the Greek Septuagint and the Masoretic text of the Old Testament, were the texts that were used in 1611 to translate what we know as the King James Version of the Bible. Well, whenever we look at translations that have followed through that same translation stream, those that have used this text family of manuscripts, namely the King James Version and the New King James Version, you find in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 a word, Lucifer. Every other translation, every other major translation from the year 1885 on has excluded this word. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about why they've done this why the term Lucifer is found in these ancient manuscripts, but it's not found in these newer manuscripts. But basically what we find is that in 1885, the English Revised Version, and then in 1901, the American Standard Version, they used a newer Hebrew text in their translation of the Old Testament. They used what was known as the Biblia Hebraica. And this text had assimilated some older manuscripts that were not available at the time that these earlier Latin and Greek texts had been translated. And what they found is that in those older manuscripts, this term that is translated Lucifer was not a name. It was a description. And so keep this in mind as we go through the lesson tonight. The Hebrew word that is translated here is the word halal. And halal in Hebrew literally means the morning star or the bearer of light. Halal was never a formal name. And we find that even when Jerome had initially translated his Latin version... It was not seen as a name, at least initially. But over time, people began to look at this and see this not as a description, but as an official name. 
And as a result of this, they had to find a way to apply this name to someone or something in order for it to make logical sense. But we know that as Bible translations have come about, we see, especially in some of those older translations, like the King James Version, there are other words that, rather than translate those words in the way that would be most literal, they created new words in order to fully encompass the religious practices of the day, such as the Greek term baptizo, which means immerse, was translated or was transliterated into a new English word, baptize. And the reason for that was because by 1611, the religious groups of the day had already begun to practice baptism, not just by immersion, but baptism by sprinkling, by pouring, and the baptism of infants. And so they knew that if they translated that term in the way that was literal to the original Greek, then that translation was not going to be accepted by the majority of people in the religious world of the day. And so they came up with a new term. Well, this term, Lucifer, we need to keep in mind as we go through this lesson tonight, it was never intended to be an official name. It was a description. So now let's begin by reading this passage that's in question, because tonight we're looking at answering this question. Who is Lucifer? Satan? A demon? An angel? Or none of the above? In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12, and I'll be reading from the New King James, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. But then, I want to share with you from the New American Standard Version. The New American Standard Version has been uh, accepted by most Bible scholars of the day as one of the most literal English translations that you can obtain today. And it translates this verse in this way. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, sun of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. So you may wonder, if this was never intended to be a name, if this was intended as a description, well, how is it that the majority of people in the world today have come to believe that this is a name? And how have the majority of them come to believe that this is a reference to Satan? Well, very early on, there were two early religious leaders, one by the name of Origen, one by the name of Tertullian. And they were studying this passage, and they began to realize that this sounds very similar to a couple of passages in the New Testament. Luke chapter 10 and verse 18 Jesus said unto them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. They thought, well, Jesus is saying he saw Satan fall from heaven. Isaiah said that Lucifer fell from heaven. Well, this must be talking about Satan. They also looked at Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, where it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. Of course, the dragon we know is symbolic of Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Now listen to this. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Due to the similarities in the wording of these two verses, in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12, very early on, there were people who began to believe that this reference, Lucifer, is referring to Satan. And that this passage in Isaiah 14 and verse 12 is talking about Satan's fall from heaven. 
Now, something that we need to remember. I mentioned this just a few moments ago. That when Jerome translated his Latin text, it was not immediately accepted that this was a name. The majority of people in those days recognized that this was a title. But as more and more of the religious leaders of the day began to latch on to this idea and began to promote this concept, you see finally in 1215, the Catholic Church held what they referred to as the Fourth Lateran Council of the Catholic Church. And they made this official decree. They said, Lucifer was the name of Satan while he was still an angel in heaven. But when he rebelled against God and was removed from heaven, his angelic name was replaced with a name more fitting of his present condition. Satan, meaning the adversary. They went on to describe that they believed that when Satan was in heaven, that he was one of what we, what's referred to as the seraphim, this grouping of angels that are always pictured as surrounding the throne of God and, and singing praises and worshiping God. They're shown as being the ones who are there in the light around the throne. They believe that Satan, or at that time, Lucifer, was one of those seraphim. Hence, they say, this is where that Hebrew term halal comes into play. They were in the light, therefore they were the bearers of the light. Well, no. The scriptures tell us that the light shone forth from the throne of God. The angels were not the ones who were shining forth that light. That light was coming from God himself. So we see that this paints a very imaginative picture, doesn't it? In some ways, it even sounds logical whenever we see these other passages of Scripture that I shared with you. But there is nothing whatsoever in the Bible that establishes that to be true. And also, I want you to brace yourself. There is absolutely nothing at all in Isaiah chapter 14 that is referring to Satan in any way. Nothing in that chapter has any reference to Satan, not directly, not figuratively. So that kind of muddies the waters a little bit. If it's not referring to Satan, if it's not a name... Well, then what is, what is Lucifer? Who, who is this referring to, or what is this referring to? Well, if we back up and we look at Isaiah 14, verses 4 through 6, we find that Isaiah clearly tells us who this is in reference to. Here God tells Isaiah, Take up this parable against the king of of Babylon. You go on reading down through the rest of this chapter. Every reference that is made is to the king of Babylon. These are not references to Satan. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us which king of Babylon this is referring to. Some say Nebuchadnezzar. I think a strong argument could be made for that. Some say Belshazzar. Some say, no, one of it's, it's got to be one of the, the more obscure kings. But that's really not the point. And I think an even stronger argument could be made that this is not talking about one single individual whatsoever. I think there's a very strong argument that can be made that this is talking about that entire family of Babylonian kings. All of those who were in power that God was using to oppress Judah. They became more and more wicked. And this warning is being given to them that they are going to be cast down. 
they're not going to retain that, that position of glory and honor that they were presently enjoying. They were going to be cast down. Well, you continue on down in this chapter. In verse 4, it talks about the oppressor. It talks about the golden city. Folks, these are both references to Babylon. The city of Babylon in antiquity was known as the golden city of the world. So this is in reference to Babylon and the ruler of Babylon. But notice that it tells us that this oppressor, well, who's the one that's being oppressed at this time? God's people. The nation of Judah had been carried off into Babylonian captivity. They were suffering in many ways. They were being forced to adopt things that were contrary to the old law. And as a result of this, God sends this prophet and he declares... You know what? You may feel like that you're on top of the world. You may feel like that there is no one higher than you. You may feel like that you are the bearer of light. But you're going to be cast down. Also keep in mind that this is a prophecy. This was delivered before that event was going to take place. And at the time that this was delivered, Babylon was the strongest nation on earth. The king of Babylon was the strongest ruler on earth. And as I said, the city of Babylon was often described in terms of great opulence, the city of gold. And her king was often described, get this, as the bearer of gold. That kind of fits in with that description, the bearer of light, doesn't it? That glory shining forth from that position. But then if you skip on down now and look at verses 7 through 12, notice it says that the whole earth is at rest and quiet. Well, at this point, why is that happening? Because the oppressor has been cast down. The one that was keeping things stirred up, the one that was oppressing God's people, has been overthrown. Due to Babylon's fall, the people who were oppressed, you know, the Bible says that they were going to break forth in songs of joy. The fig trees rejoice, rejoice over you. The cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. Both of these are figurative references to the people of Judah. They're praising God and they're singing about the fall of Babylon. The cedars of Lebanon saying, you know what, since Babylon fell, we're not being oppressed anymore. No one else has rose up to oppress us. But we're also told even that Hell from beneath is excited about you to meet you at your coming. You know, that's not a very pleasant statement, isn't it? This is alluding to the wickedness of the kings of Babylon and how it led to the devil and his angels rejoicing because they had won another soul to their cause. Going on, it stirs up the dead for you, even all the chief ones of the earth. Most references I looked at said that this is referring to all of the previous people that that had tried to carry out the same things that the king of Babylon was doing. All of these that had rebelled against God, had oppressed his people, all of them are now looking up to see, well, what has happened to Babylon? We thought surely Babylon would be the one that would carry this out. No, Babylon has now been overthrown. It is raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations. And this is talking about all the kings of those nations that were being oppressed by Babylon. All of those kingdoms that had been conquered, that were being forced to submit to the rule of Babylon. They're rejoicing over this. 
because they've now won their independence. They're no longer under that submission. They all shall speak and say to you, Have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to shoal or to the grave, and the sound of your stringed instruments. Well, this is alluding to the, the, the great pomp and pride that goes with a monarch. You know, as monarchs would travel and come into a great city, oftentimes there would be the sounding of trumpets and great fanfare. What this is saying is that all of those individuals, all of the devil and his angels, they're going to be sitting there wondering, okay, where's the fanfare now? What has happened to you? Where's that arrogance that you had in life? Why aren't you still that way? The next statement is one that's not pleasant. The maggot is spread under you. Worms cover you. I think that's self-explanatory. But after all of this, we come to the verse in question. And I ask you up to this point, have you seen any references to Satan? Have you seen any references to demons? Have you seen any references to angels? No. The only reference that we see here in this entire context is to the king of Babylon. And so again, looking at this statement, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Now keeping this verse in context, God is using this analogy of falling from heaven to reference the overthrowing of the king of Babylon. Because in his own mind, in the mind of the king of Babylon, he had exalted himself to the point of deity. Remember Nebuchadnezzar at one time had erected a statue and had demanded that they bow down before it? He was viewing himself on the position of deity. But the analogy that's used here, and I look at this and I see it, or the best way I see to understand it, is almost looking at this with a degree of sarcasm. Here you have the king of Babylon who thought that he was on high, who thought that he was in control, who thought that he was divine, but he's now been brought back down to earth. You know, it's a statement that we sometimes hear people say. You know, you get a big head, you get to thinking too high of yourself, and you have to be brought back down to earth. That's what happened with the king of Babylon. He believed that he was this great shining light when in fact he was the farthest thing from it. Verses 13 through 16 go on to elaborate on this point, give further evidence to what we're looking at. But you said in your heart... I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Notice what Isaiah is saying. He says the king of Babylon has exalted himself above the heavens. He's not saying that he's equal with God. He's saying that he is above God. He is superior to God. Therefore, when God chose this language to refer to the king of Babylon, it was very appropriate when he said, You have fallen from heaven. You have fallen from this lofty position that you believed yourself to be in from that self-proclaimed arrogant position of being greater than the Most High God. Babylon had fallen. But then God goes on to say in verses 15 through 17, Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol. Sheol is a term referring to the grave. 
into the recesses of the pit, and those who see you will gaze at you, they will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home? All of the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you have been cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch, clothed with the slain who are pierced with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a trampled corpse. You know, we could keep reading, but we find that as this chapter goes on, it's a continuation of this same thought, this same idea. But up to this point, we've seen the gist of this prophecy. We've seen what Isaiah is saying to this king of Babylon. That he was going to fall. He was going to be cast down. And he talks about all of these other former kings in all of their glory. He says, you know what? They're lying in their tombs. Well, what does that reference mean? It means people remember them. Their glory continues to be beheld. People continue to visit their tombs and remember the things that they accomplished. He said, you are not going to have that luxury. You're not going to have your own tomb. People aren't going to remember you for any form of greatness. You're going to be cast down. Now notice... When we look at this context, we cannot say that this is referring to Satan because it has no reference to Satan. We cannot say that it's referring to one of Satan's angels, the demons. It has no reference to it. It would be taking it out of context. The only thing we see that truly fits the description that is here is that this is a prophecy concerning the fall of the nation of Babylon. And this term Lucifer is used to refer to the king of Babylon. Let me tell you some other interesting information about this term. We have just a few minutes left. As I mentioned earlier in this lesson, Lucifer is a Latin word that appeared for the first time in Jerome's Latin translation of the Bible. But there is a Greek equivalent to this word. And here is where this lesson, in my opinion, really takes an interesting twist. If you turn to First Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, we find the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word halal, the Latin word Lucifer. Notice this passage. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns. And notice, here's where the word is used. The morning star arises in your hearts. So let's ask that same question about this passage. Who or what is being described in this passage? Folks, in this passage, Peter is describing the true enlightenment that only comes from the word of Christ. The true morning star is the gospel shining the light of God's truth, revealing that to those who are lost in sin. And so when we look at this, who would we have to say is the bearer of light? Who is the morning star? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. But then, if we look at a couple of other passages, we see a better description. Look at verse 17 through the first part of verse 19. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father. Has Satan ever received glory and honor from God the Father? No. 
Have demons ever received glory from God the Father? No. Such an utterance as this was made to Him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son. Has God ever referred to Satan as His Son? What about the demons? No. Who's the only person in the Bible that God describes as His beloved Son? Christ. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with Him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. If we go back again into the Old Testament, we find the great psalm of praise for the Word of God, Psalm 119. And we read in verse 104, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, with that understanding, look at what Peter says in the last line of 2 Peter 1 and verse 19. Until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. In other words, pay attention to the light. Pay attention to the light, the word of Christ, until the dawn of eternity comes. Until Jesus comes again and we stand before Him in judgment, pay attention to the true bearer of that light. Well, this reference to the first light of dawn or the morning star, we find this used multiple places in the Scriptures in reference to Christ. For example, Revelation 22 and verse 16. Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. But then do you remember a promise that Jesus made there at the end of Revelation chapter 2? Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 through 28. And he who overcomes... And he who keeps my deeds until the end. Listen to this. To him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. So just as Jesus received the morning star, received authority from his father. He says he is going to give the morning star to those who overcome this world. So from the passages that we've considered in the New Testament, this term can be describing one of three different things. It can be referring to Christ himself. It can be referring to the gospel. Or it can be referring to the glory of Christ that is going to shine upon all of the faithful at the day of judgment. So here's where it gets really interesting. You may be tired of hearing me say that. But in my opinion, here is where it gets really, really interesting. Under the law of Moses, when Isaiah delivered God's prophecy, the word halal in Hebrew is used to refer to the arrogant, pompous attitude that the king of Babylon had. He viewed himself as being superior to all. He viewed himself as having all authority, as being superior to even God himself. And it's used to describe his downfall. So technically... This term, Lucifer, even though it's an erroneous term, should never have been used. This term, Lucifer, in the Old Testament refers to the king of Babylon. But when we come into the New Testament, as we noted, the Greek equivalent of this very same term is used to refer to Christ. Is used to refer to the saving power of the gospel. And the glory of Christ that will be given to those who are granted a home in heaven. So we could actually make a very, very strong argument that Lucifer in the New Testament is Jesus Christ. Kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? 
So again, there are no references in the Bible whatsoever to this erroneous term, Lucifer, referring to Satan, referring to the demons, referring to anything evil at all. But to the king of Babylon, and somewhat in a sarcastic way in reference to his pompous attitude, but then in the New Testament to Christ, the gospel of Christ, and eternal salvation. Well, I hope that this lesson has been one that has helped you to come to a better understanding of this. Like I said this morning when I announced this lesson, I've really enjoyed preparing this because this is a subject that there's been so much false ideas out there promoted in regard to this. But hopefully this has cleared up some of that for you. But tonight, as we bring this lesson to a close, we want to pause and reflect upon our spiritual condition. Are you living a faithful Christian life tonight? If so, God bless you. Keep up the good work. But if you realize that there are things in your life that are amiss, that you've not been living your life the way that you should, then we encourage you to come back to Christ. Repent of your sins. Be restored to the faith. Or if you've never obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to become a Christian tonight by placing your faith in Jesus as God's Son. Repent of your sins. Confess the faith you have in Christ and be baptized. Have your sins washed away. The Lord will add you to the church. Leave this place tonight knowing that you're in a right relationship with your Heavenly Father. Tonight, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come while we stand and sing.